This fits with today's message because you can have all the icing on the cake. You can have the lights. You can have the sound system. Next week, we're going to have a full band. We're taking another step. But when you strip it all away, it comes down to as simple as his word. It's what he spoke from the very first day he spoke the world into existence. He says, my words are spirit and they are life. It's because when he speaks, life happens. It's not later. It's instant. It is finished, he said on the cross. Then, that meant it was done. It's not just because he said it. It's because when he said it, he released spirit, life, and it was finished. Thank you, worship team. We're so glad to have you in the house today. If you're glad to be here, how many had a donut before church? Donut Sunday. We got some things going on with the lights buzzing. But do me a favor. Find three people and tell them, if you didn't get a donut, you missed it. Jesus' name. Come on. Find somebody on your way to your seats and tell them, if you didn't get a donut, you missed it. You didn't get a donut, you missed it. In Jesus' name. Those were Jesus donuts. Y'all may be seated. <laughs> Let's give it up for Savannah. I think she did a great job. It's her first time doing announcements, and she, uh, she did an awesome job. Savannah, you can clap for yourself. It's okay. People won't look at you weird if you clap for yourself. It's so quiet. Come on, guys. Let me know you're here. I don't see, there you go. I don't see you as good because we know we got the lights fixed. So if I can't see you, I got to hear it right. If I don't hear it right, I don't think anything happened. But, you know, it's kind of funny. My kids are always asking me why I get to do things that they don't. And they say things like, why do you get more sugar than us? Why do you get more fruit snacks? If I want them, I don't eat them. But if I wanted them, I could have them. Why do you play on your phone so much, Daddy, but you limit our tablet time? Why do you get more cookies if I ate them? Only at 2 in the morning when no one's looking. So it's a work in progress, guys. Why do you get the cookies and we only get one per day? And as a parent, the best part about being a parent to my Brendan and my Brandon in the house. What's up, guys? The best part about being a parent, Brendan and Brandon, that's a, that's a tongue tire. Just call them the double Bs. The best part about being a parent is you get to say, because I said so. Because I'm the boss. I'm the adult. But when they argue with you, you don't owe them an explanation. You don't have to show them why you deserve more cookies than them. You don't have to show them why you get to have free reign in your own house that you paid for. It's because I said, so it is. There's no secondary approval or, or proving process. And they just got to deal with it because they're your child. It's because I said so. They like to, they like to do this thing. Oh, makes me crazy. I used to think it was cute, but after about four years of when I'd say something, they'd go, oh, I started getting angry. I said, you quit making that noise. It was like a whiny thing, and it became like not cute anymore. I said, it's because I said so. I don't need to show you nothing. Daddy, why do you click on the computer all day? They think that's my work. Click on the computer. They just think I click on the screen. I wish it was that easy. It's because that's what daddy has to do. Well, why? Because that's what I have to do, because I said so. That's why. I don't owe you an, an, an example. But kids are funny. Their faith is pure enough that they're okay with that when you tell them firmly. You tell them, it's because I said so. They're good most of the times, unless they haven't had a nap like Taz. They'll ask you three or four times, and then they're good. But can you imagine if there was a way just to speak something 
And it became so like a superpower that was gifted to you by one of the Marvel comic characters, not Captain America. Nobody wants to be him. But like a cool one like Iron Man and not Batman. He wasn't real. But like Superman or Spider-Man. And then your power was if you just spoke it, boom, done. End of story kind of like with your children, you know, but with everything. When God speaks, that's what happens. Things happen. It's important to recognize the power of God on your life may be initiated by a small word or two. Not some monumental move wave in this heavens open. That could happen too, but it doesn't have to happen. And it usually starts with A word. First, he spoke. If God spoke something over your life, you wouldn't be able to see it, but you might hear it if you listen closely. Do you believe your circumstance could be healed, take a new direction, or be catapulted into a new realm of possibility just because you heard him and received his word. It's that simple. My passage today is Matthew chapter 8 verse, let me, let me, give me a commercial real quick. Um, I broke my thumb yesterday. It's awesome. And, uh, you know, I seem pretty happy, but it really did hurt. And I got four stitches and just thought I'd throw that out there because I got this cool bandage and it almost slipped off and it's really gory, but It was, um, I don't know, it just happens. It'll be good in about three weeks, hopefully. Be back playing the guitar, but um, my passage today is a a story of a Roman authority over 100 men. You know, the centurion, you guys remember him, right? It's a famous passage, chapter 8, verse 5 through 13. There's something special about this guy. He was... Weird compared to the normal Jews around. He was different. And he introduced a very simple concept to a very educated people who knew the law, but they didn't understand Jesus, which was the new covenant, the new dispensation, the new contract, the new deal with mankind. They were still caught up in the heavy burden in the in, in the 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 hard yoke. But Jesus says, my burden is light. My yoke is easy. They didn't understand he's teaching them. And they come across this man in chapter 8, verse 5. It says, now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion, who is a ruler over a hundred men, came to him pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I'll come and heal him. I'll do it. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. He recognized he wasn't worthy of the meal. He just wanted the crumbs off the table. You know what I'm saying? You know, they called them dogs back then. They weren't a Jew. The Jews called them dogs because they were willing to eat the scraps off the table. That's a different passage. They were fed off just some crumbs because they knew just a little would be all they needed. You know what I'm saying? You guys with me? He just spoke the world. It didn't say he plotted a six-year plan how to build the world. It said he spoke it, and it was done. It just was a little bit. He says, but that's all I need. For I, verse 9, for I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go. And he goes. And to another, come. And he comes. And to my servant, do this. And he does it. And when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed us, surely, I say to you, I have not such, found such great faith, not even in Israel, not even God's natural people. I have not seen this. You know, it's kind of like in the job, if you, I don't want to say you're their boss, if you are their supervisor or somebody reports to you, you don't have to 
check on everything they do. If you do, then there's a problem, right? If it's done right, you just say, this needs to be done. It's taken care of. You don't need to worry about it. You just spoke what needed to be. And the centurion understood this. And he also saw, Jesus also saw that this was not the norm for all his people, the Jews, who had to see some miracles first. They needed a reason. And Jesus says to all them that were around because he was marveled by this man's faith. And I say to you that many will come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Translated, bad stuff will happen to you. You will not be there with me, he is saying. Some will, some won't. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go your way as you have believed, so let it be done to you. And his servant was healed that same hour. The title of my message is Just Speak. Just speak. It's not anything more than that. It's just speak. Speak. God's power on my life is activated by my faithfulness. And faithfulness starts with speaking. We speak in praise. We speak in prayer. We hear God. It's all about words. But some people need a reason before they become faithful. And they get grace confused with faithfulness. They get belief confused with faithfulness. Faithfulness is the fruit of belief when it's manifesting into action. Grace is the doorway. Grace doesn't make me faithful. Grace is how I'm allowed the opportunity to be faithful to a Lord who deserves nothing but the best because he is Lord whether you want to serve him or not. He still is. And the centurion knew the simplicity that he didn't need a sign and wonder. He didn't need a reason. But, you know, you can say in, in our culture today, it's the same. We need to see God move before we will move for God. Why, why should we? I, I hate that I think of the Tracy Chapman. Give me one reason to stay here. That's what pops in my mind every time I think of give me one reason and I won't sing the rest of that song because it wouldn't be appropriate. But that's, that's what comes in my mind. And, give, and I'll turn and run around. Give me one reason to be here and I'll give you praise to the Lord. That's not how it works. That's not how this God's song goes. But man desires a reason to do something, a reason to be faithful. Show me your real God and then I'll be faithful. Because I got grace. Oh, that message is coming. That's the most abused word in the Bible. God doesn't owe us a reason, but he promises a resolution upon faithfulness. Coming to church doesn't do God a favor. Coming to church is a way to grow and to give praise back and to release what has already been given to you, whether we recognize it or not. And we all know we live in a culture where the world sees church as this like task. That's not, that's not what it's about. Faithfulness is a lifestyle for God. It's living for God and operating under the umbrella of I got grace, but my life shows nothing about my faithfulness. That's a problem. Because that's not faithfulness. You remember when Jesus said a prophet is not without honor except in his own country? It's because they didn't have any faith there. Remember it said he couldn't do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. And here, the simplest thing, the the centurion said, just speak it and he'll be healed. See, the the faith is based on your faithfulness, not on God uh, having to have a certain uh, level of uh, mighty faith to do something. He does it in, in whatever realm you have giving your heart to him wholeheartedly. And for the centurion, it was as simple as speaking a word. So God said, okay. But when he went back to, you know, to Nazareth, his hometown, he couldn't do much there because they had no faith. It takes faith. And faith is not just having grace. Faith is showing your life approved, showing yourself approved. Know thy word. Show the word is fervent in your heart and your life is creating fruits that bear your creator. Jesus. But it's easy in our nature to want a reason first to serve God. And most of the miracles in the New Testament weren't for God. 
that because man couldn't see with their spiritual eyes or hear with their spiritual ears, they couldn't hear God speak until he really had to get their attention first. They're kind of hard-headed, you know, like, if you raise someone from the dead, then I might follow you. Okay, Jesus. So he raised Lazarus. He didn't want to raise Lazarus. There was no benefit for him to do that. But if you read the passage, he, he, he wept because he had to go through and do this because they weren't getting it, that he was the resurrection. So he did that. But the centurion was different. He didn't need to see God raise someone from the dead. He didn't need God to come to his house All he needed was for God to speak it, and he knew it was finished. How did they know that? God didn't show him that. It said he was faithful, more faithful than all of Israel, all of Israel, all the way back to Father Abraham. No one taught him that. It's because he recognized that we are faithful by who he is. If we believe he is creator, we don't have to, uh, he doesn't have to earn our faithfulness. We just are faithful because of who he is, not because of what he's doing in our life first. Those are the fruits of the faithfulness. That's why the servant was healed because the centurion was faithful to begin with. And sometimes God is waiting on you to take that first step. You're waiting on a reason and God says, I'm waiting on a step. Well, God, I just have, I just have my grace. Okay, well, you don't go to church. You don't read my word. You don't pray. You, you, you talk like a sailor. You, you, do, you, do, you look like the world to me. So how would I know? What, what, what is your behavior? What faithfulness do you show? Like the centurion. What separates you from the crowd? Well, nothing. Nothing. Take a step. You want to see change? Take a step. God's not going to drag you down the path to righteousness. That's why they say, follow me. He didn't say, I'm going to drag you with me. He said, follow me, and I'll, I'll take you to the land flowing with milk and honey like the Israelites. But they had to act in faith. And God's power in my life is activated by my faithfulness. Jesus says, I don't need to give you a reason. I went to the cross for you. That's enough. That's enough. How many know it's enough? If Jesus never else never did a miracle for you in your life, he never answered any of your prayers, but you believe he went to the cross and know that he gave his life for you, how many would that be enough for? That would be enough for it, right? We know that, but we still battle with, nah, but I'm going to miss this. I want to do this. Give me some more reason, God. It's our flesh. We're battling our flesh, and you can't win against principalities of darkness with flesh because we're born into sin. We are sinful by, by birth. We're born into it. If I only move when God gave me a sign first, my steps might be few. I was that way for a long time. I had the burden of ministry on my heart for years and years and years, but I kept waiting for God to give me a sign, Lord. Give me a sign. So guess what happened? Nothing. Just more years went by. And it finally came to a point where I see, how this, I see how this life thing is going, and it's time to take steps. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what that looks like. I've never done that. But I'm going to go. I'm going to start walking. And then immediately God will start steering. When you quit waiting on a reason, God will steer you as you move. He won't pull you down the path, but he will shine a light on what that path looks like as you start walking. It's so easy, we, we think of it backwards, you know what I mean? Like, we think it's this complicated thing because he's God, but he made it so simple. That's why the, the people in the scriptures that were the most faithful were the most simple. Not that they were not able, it's that they just had simple lives. Fisherman, you know, tax collector, I guess he had, you know, good accounting skills. But, you know, they, they just were normal people and were faithful, like a child's faith. The Bible says a child's faith is pure. If we are to get into heaven, it says we must have faith like a child. Hey, that's challenging to be faithful like a child because I know too much. I'm smart. We think sometimes, but you can't outsmart God. And you can't, you can't figure out the riddle of God's path that he will give you. 
So quit trying and know that it may be so much easier and you'll lose all the pressure and you will change your life if you just start walking. And could it be you've yet to see God change your situation or move in your life like you've desired because your faithfulness has been non-existent? Give me one reason I'm faithful. I serve you, Lord. The centurion knew there was more, though. He said, give me a word, Lord. Just give me a word. I don't need a reason because I know who you are, but give me a word. You know, like anybody like Target? Everybody loves Target. Nick likes Target? <laughs> That's weird. I hated Target when I was your age. I was pro-Walmart until I shopped at Target, and then I shopped at Walmart, and then I, anyway. Sorry, Walmart. Well, my kids, when they have a birthday, somehow they get a little bit of cash money in their pocket from aunts and uncles, I don't know. People just randomly throw money at them on the street. I don't know where that comes from, to be honest, Nate. I don't know where the money comes from, but it comes from somewhere. And they like to go birthday shopping with the leftover money after we pre-charge them for all their gifts that they got and we take, but no, we don't take a cut. They go to Target with their, their birthday money and Colton, he's at this stage, he's just turned six, where it's almost more joy to him to hear the confirmation than to do the actual shopping. Can we, go to, can we go to Target with my birthday money? Okay. Yay! It could never happen after that. He'd totally forget. But it's because we simply gave him the confirmation of a word. He was good. He didn't need more than that. Now, Chloe, if you did that to her, she's going to circle back with you. Say, uh, when are we going? When's it going to happen, Dad? Three, four times. You said it was going to happen. Did you forget, Dad? Do you need me to write it down for you? That's how thorough she is. But Colton is so faithful, he just says, okay, Father. And then he forgets all about it. He just needs a word. All we need is a word from God, and things happen. It starts with a word. Being pregnant with the Spirit of the Lord starts with a word. It doesn't start with the sky falling. When we realize we are not worthy. Our faith is skyrocketed like the centurion. He says, you are not worthy to come in my house, Jesus. I just need a table scrap, a crumb. That's all I need. Remember, remember the, the girl who just wanted to touch his garment? All I got to do is touch your garment, and that's enough. I just need that much virtue. Greater is your faith than all of Israel because you know the power of his word, he said to the centurion. My hope doesn't live in the bounds of miracles and sign. My hope is in my word. It's word. And my, God's power on my life is activated by my faithfulness through his word. We are what we speak. And his word never changes, never dies, never expires you guys ever heard someone say, I didn't say that, my word said that. I didn't lie to you, my word lied to you. Last I checked, that's the same thing. You can't separate you from your word. The word was made flesh. The expression of God in the, time, in the, in the form of time and space to mankind was this thing called the word, the plan of redemption, encapsulated in a name that Jehovah would save his people from their sins. So he was named in the Greek word Jesus, which is Yeshua, which is Jehovah saves. He was the blueprint, the plan of redemption, the word God spoke. You guys seeing how it's as simple as he spoke things. My words are spirit. They're a life. If I want major change, I have to start with his word. If I abandon his word, I abandon God. When I don't read enough, I go up and down. I've always struggled with reading. It depends on the time of the day. Reading books in general, especially the Bible, you got to be focused because it can, you know, sometimes you can like fall asleep. Sometimes you can, you know, it's just sometimes I don't remember what I read. It takes real work until you get into it. And then the life starts happening because he starts getting you by the spirit. But it's hard. And if I drift from his word, I start feeling empty. I start feeling like I haven't eaten. Because I haven't. I'm starving because I'm not getting fed any word. 
That's my favorite church people thing. I just wasn't getting fed. I'm so thankful that my job is not to try to fix people. My job is to try to facilitate God's word because he is the healer. His word is where the power is. And if you deliver the word to people, you deliver the power. If you take the word from the people, you've got a shell and it will crack like Humpty Dumpty on the ledge. The word is the seed. We must plant one seed, two seeds, three seeds, millions of seeds in the hearts of people to produce harvest. And when we become faithful, God's words f- fall on a good soil, the Bible says. It produces deep roots. But God won't yell at you, but he will speak a simple word or two when you invite him in to give you a word. When you recognize the power of the word of God, and it's the root, it's the seed, that's when your faithfulness skyrockets and you desire more. You desire his spirit. His spirit comes by hearing the word. What I hear is what I do. And when I become pregnant with the word, I can never overflow living waters until I've received what is the living water, which is his word. The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the spirit. We can call it whatever we want. It's Jesus It's the spirit that dwelt in Christ. He was conceived of the spirit. It's just a fancy way to say, God, give me your spirit, Lord. Give me your spirit. And until I receive your word, I'll never experience receiving your spirit. Because soil has to produce fruit. And soil can't produce fruit unless it's planted with The word, the seed, the Holy Spirit, his power. Now we are able to speak boldly in the name of Jesus as we allow the spirit to work through us. It is by the spirit we do all things as Christians because he is to lead and guide us. Then you you, you find yourself doing things you, you didn't know you could do. It's because it's not of you. You are a vessel, and now you are doing things boldly in the name of Christ, just like he told the apostles, go and wait for power on high. I will give you a sign. Before you can preach my great commission, you can't do that until I have endued you with power. So he told them to go wait. He was talking about the infilling of the Spirit, the first outpouring when they spoke with tongues, and they didn't know what was going on. It's Acts chapter 2. It's the Bible. I don't make this stuff up, but that's what he told them to do. He said, because you're going to get a sign, and when you get my sign, Now you know you are ready because you have my spirit. I will give you a sign. And that's what he did. If he didn't give him a sign, he wouldn't know. And when you understand the power of God's word, you understand that you need his spirit. And when you know you need his spirit, you'll invite God. Come on, somebody. How many are glad that his spirit still lives today? It's not a figure of speech. It's a living word of God that was breathed into us since the beginning of time when he spoke the world into existence. God's power is activated in my life by my faithfulness. Jesus will move when you speak his word. It's who he is. The word made flesh. Well, I just don't think God will change my situation. He probably won't, if that's what you think. The reason he changed the centurion situation because he believed and was faithful that God could just speak it and it would be done. If he said, well, God, I don't think that's going to work, just like the people in his hometown, it doesn't work. It's because faithfulness produces miracles, signs, and wonders. Not miracle signs, and wonders produce faithfulness. It starts with us. Can you all stand with me? It's a small church, and so it's, we're in a big room and in You know, it can be awkward. But there's a point where you have to invite God into your life. And some people have and some people haven't. And you're always asking for God to give you more word. Because even when you're full of the word, you can go dry. If you drift, you need to stay in God's word. 
And some of you are begging God for a miracle over your lives and situations, but you've yet to speak to him. You've yet to ask him to come into, Lord, come into my life, Jesus. I need you, God. I need you. I need you more than anything, Lord. I, I, I pray you come into my heart, Jesus. I pray for your word. Every, every service we pray, we actually forgot today. We pray every service before for God's anointing because we know that without God's anointing on this place, it's just a show. We want it to be an anointed temple for the living God of all eternity. So we pray that he has his way so that I speak it right, so that we we give our best in our worship, so that we draw the spirit near through our faithfulness. He comes and moves on his people. That's what we pray. But before it can be done so, it must be spoken. Because your God operates in the realm of faith. We don't need all this stuff. It starts with getting pregnant with the word. We don't need the school. We don't need... Jesus was born in a barn. Let me remind you. It's stinky. We don't need all the stuff. This is... You know why we have all the stuff and we have so many pictures of me? It's not about me. It's about playing the world's game to get their attention, to separate yourself so then I can give them the real me, which is Jesus Christ. It's not about me and, and Roku and, and, and YouTube and social media and, and cool and look, show, 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 show. I hate that stuff. But that is what you have to do to separate from all the other dozens trying to proclaim the same thing. And when you get the world's attention, like T.D. Jakes, I was watching T.D. Jakes last night, and he said the world had, he had the world's attention and he was terrified and when he got the world's attention somebody told him now is your chance to give them what you've been praying for all these years you got the whole it was 200 something reporters he had waiting to hear him speak at something a few years ago and he was terrified it's because he finally had gotten an opportunity to speak his heart and was so afraid of what the world might do someone in his staff had to remind him this is what you're praying for this is not a burden this is opportunity so we're playing the game we're playing the game. We're, gonna get, we're trying to get people attention separately. We play different music. We try to do it different. We're going to have live music. We're going to do all these things. But if it all went away today, I could tell you the same thing in my living room, that Jesus Christ lives. His blood still saves. He still fills people with the Spirit of God. The Holy Ghost is still a real thing. People are still born again. It wasn't for the new, it wasn't for the first generation church. It was for the church, which is the birth of the church in Acts. That's why we say, they say, well, what, what, where do you come from? What affiliation? We're no affiliation. We're a Jesus affiliation. We teach the Bible. You're going to categorize us into some kind of box so you can say, I don't need to come to your church because I already know what you think. Well, if you know what I think, then good because it's the book of Acts. We think, we think the plan of salvation according to the book of Acts. We think the Bible. We think Jesus. We give the word. It's that easy. And we pray that God gives the increase from there. We couldn't do this without that. He gives the increase. But until faithfulness happens, you wouldn't see all that. And just the fact that you are faithful today by showing up in church, you probably learned something. Maybe you didn't know that. Yeah, that's really what it, that's what it is. We're tricking the devil. We're tricking the devil to open up the door for revival. I don't use that word too often, but we're going to trick the devil and people are going to think it's all good and dandy. And then when we get their ears open, their spiritual ears, we're going to hit them with the Holy Spirit of God and they're going to see lives changed. And it takes time. It takes patience. I was at the, <laughs> I was at the, the urgent care and the, guy, the doctor was talking to me. I was talking about church and stuff. I said, yeah, you know, sometimes I'm not very patient. And you know, you, you think, He's pastor of the church. You should know. You should know what you're doing all the time. But it's a good reminder. As I was leaving the thing, he goes, "Stay patient." I was like, "Dear God, was that you speaking through the doctor?" It was like 20 minutes later. All he said was, "Stay patient." God answers in mysterious ways, and and I know that. But it's a reminder that consistency 
is part of faithfulness. Faithfulness is not putting God on a timeline. Faithfulness is not saying, if by then, then this. No, it's like, I'm going to endure because it's who he is. I'm not waiting to have a reason to endure longer. It's who he is. So I'm going to be faithful and patient and consistent. And we're going to see lives change. And it takes consistency. And it's hard work to get the devil's hands off God's people in this world we live in. But we're going to do it. We're going to do it. I challenge you, if everybody could close their eyes, bow your heads, and lift up one hand, just in a step of faith. If that's new to you, I challenge you in a step of faith, just, just to lift one hand. Everybody's eyes are closed. No one's looking at you. Show him that you want more. And that you know he has more. And that you don't need a reason. And say, God, I invite you into my life. Just speak it into my life, God. Speak your word into my heart. Just speak. Just speak. When I leave here today, just speak my steps, God. Just speak my work, God. Speak what I should do with my life, Jesus. Speak how I should serve you. Speak, Lord. Show me you're here. Let me feel your presence, God. Lord, we come to you in your mighty name, the name given among all men that we may be saved and no other name can save us. And we pray your hand on this house, Jesus. There is needs here. There is tribulation here. There is, there is signs and wonders that have happened here. There is hurt, heartache here. There is all kinds of situations that we don't, we don't know about and we don't need to know about, but you know about them. And by our faithfulness, we pray now you take them away, God. You, you, you take care of the situation. We leave them here today, God. We leave them at this altar. We leave them for you because we know all you have to do is speak it, and it is finished like you said on the cross. You said, Eli, Eli, Sabachthani, it is finished, and I don't need anything else. And the heavens opened, and the veil was torn. Keep your hand on us. As we go about this week and we continue to worship you, let us give us your best, give us our best praise to you, Lord God, in Jesus' name. And if everybody could say amen.